Welcome to the second part of our machine learning for the working mathematician seminar. So you've heard enough from Joel Georg and myself, and now it's time to hear from people that have done really interesting stuff with this, these techniques. And uh, today it's a real pleasure to have um, Adam Wagner here. I was really blown away by his paper when I first saw it. So he's talking about using reinforcement learning to generate counterexamples in graph theory. And if you would like to read a kind of popular account of this work, there's a really nice article in Quanta that was written about this paper. And just, we, we haven't met RLs so much in our seminar so far. So this is reinforcement learning. And basically this is an area where, that people really struggle to make work. So I think that this is one of the first times that a mathematician has really made reinforcement work um, so that's why a lot of people are excited about this work. So um, thank you very much, Adam, and we're very much looking forward to your talk. Yeah, I mean, thank you so much for this super kind introduction, Jordi, and it's a real pleasure to give a talk in the seminar. Thank you all for coming. So today I will tell you a little bit about how to find counterexamples to various conjectures in mathematics by using some reinforcement learning methods. And the main idea of the talk will be the following. We have all these companies, such as DeepMind, for example, that have created programs that can play chess, Go, and Atari games at superhuman levels. And the really interesting thing to me about these programs is that they started from only knowing the rules of the game, and they figured out everything else just by playing the games many, many times, just by themselves. So given the success of these self-learning algorithms, how nice would it be if you could use these so-called reinforcement learning algorithms and find a way to apply them in mathematics as well. So for example, you could imagine that instead of inputting the rules of chess, you could go ahead and input the rules of the game where the goal of the player is to construct a graph with as many edges as possible without, let's say, any cycles of length four. So you can kind of imagine how something like this could be phrased as a game. You have a player, uh, you start offering each possible edge of an n-vertex complete graph to the player one by one. For each edge, the player can make a decision, do I want to keep this edge or do I want to reject this edge? After we have offered every single edge and the player has made a decision for each of them, the game ends, and then the player ends up with some kind of final construction for this game. And at this point, we need to assign some kind of score to the player, some kind of feedback depending on reflecting how well it did. So in this particular game, the feedback or the score could be something like you get one point for each edge and you get a hundred point penalty for each cycle of length four that you created. Um, and that's going to represent how well you've done in the game. So the idea is that we input this game together with the score function. We tell the program to try to learn by yourself how to get a high score in this game. We go away on a holiday for a few days, and when we come back, we find a program that is very good at constructing graphs with many edges and no four cycles. So we will see how well this works in practice in just a second. But the main reason why this approach would be good if it works is that it would be an extremely general approach. So you can take almost any conjecture that could potentially have a finite counterexample could try to phrase it as a game in some player form, input this conjecture as a game to the program, and tell it to try to get good at the game of finding a counterexample to the conjecture. So that's exactly what our goal is going to be. We will see how well it works in practice in just a second, and whether we can actually do something interesting with this. But before I begin the talk, I do have to point out that I am definitely not an expert in machine learning. So everything I'm going to tell you is just stuff I've learned in the past two years. So please take everything with a grain of salt. All right. So before we begin with RL, let me first give you again a quick overview of some of the most typical applications of machine learning. And then we are going to contrast it with reinforcement learning and see what the differences and similarities are. So, one of the most typical applications of machine learning is to make predictions. So you could do something like you start with a database in a large housing market. For each house, you know how many rooms it has, what size it is, and so on, and what price it was sold at. The idea here is that you have some kind of program that is going to learn from this 
data set is so called training set. And once you have a trained algorithm, you need to be able to use it to make predictions. So if I give you a data on a new house, you need to be able to tell me, give me a good guess about what the price of this house should be. Another very common application is called uh, for making uh, classification problems. So here, instead of a database on houses, you could start, for example, with 1,000 pictures of cats and 1,000 pictures of dogs. Again, you'd have to train some algorithm on this training set, and afterwards, you need to be able to use it to classify any future pictures as cats or dogs. And there are many other similar problems that fall into this classification category, such as uh, deciding whether an email is spam or not, recognizing char handwritten characters, and so on. A slightly different kind of problem is called generative problems, where instead of classifying or making predictions, you need to be able to generate new things that fit into your training data set. So for example, you could start with 1,000 pictures of human portraits, and your goal could be to generate a new image that fits into this data set, but it's not already there. So for example, this picture here was generated by a program called Stalgen, and this woman in this picture probably doesn't actually exist. Um, again, there are a bunch of similar problems that fall into this category. For example, if we know the first 26 letters of the alphabet, what will a potential 27th letter look like, and so on. And just a fourth application that's very different from the previous ones is for language models. Here, I only want to mention one particular program, program called GPT-3. Um, the way GPT-3 works is it's a prompt completion program, so you can input some kind of prompt, like, I want to apply for a PhD, please write me a teaching statement. And if you enter this prompt, it will output some kind of teaching statement for you. Sometimes it's pretty good. Sometimes it's not so good. It's a bit random. But you can also input other things, such as the University of Sydney wants to hire a new math professor. This is their job advertisement. And if you do that, you end up with something that's something like this. And if you don't look very closely, then it just looks like a very reasonable job description. I think the only main issue here is in this third paragraph, where for some reason the program insists that Sydney's logo for maths is three men setting up spherical cocoa, and because of that, they're looking for professors to teach car-related courses. But other than that, it's a very reasonably written job description. All right. But today, we are not here to talk about these classical areas of machine learning applications. Today, we are here to talk about reinforcement learning. And there are a couple main differences between reinforcement learning and all these four applications that I showed you here today. So one of the main differences is that in all of these four applications, you needed to start with a big training data set to train your algorithm on. In reinforcement learning, we start with an algorithm that knows absolutely nothing about the program, about the problem, and we are going to learn directly by interacting with the environment by playing the game. Another difference is that while these four applications of machine learning have a lot of real life uses, this really cannot be said about reinforcement learning. So if you start Googling things like um, applications of reinforcement learning in real life, you will find stuff like robotics, for example. But to the best of my knowledge, all these big famous robotics companies they're not actually using um, reinforcement learning so much. They're more using control theory, which is a different thing. So it's not clear to me that reinforcement learning has, it has some real life applications, but definitely not as many as these four areas that I showed you. But one thing reinforcement learning algorithms are really good at is getting good at games if we start only from first principles, from only knowing the rules. And that's exactly what we're going to use it for today. All right, so what is reinforcement learning in a nutshell? Well, you have an agent, a player, and the game, and the agent will play the game many, many, many times. Um, initially, it knows absolutely nothing about the game. It only knows what actions it's allowed to take, or in other words, what buttons it's allowed to press in any given situation. By playing the game many times, it starts gathering experience and learning the game. And the type of experience it gathers is that if in this state, 
I press this button, then this is what happens, and this is how much score I got at the end. So that's the idea. There's some kind of optimization algorithm running in the background, and through this, you, uh, this algorithm will eventually learn how to optimize the total score it can get in the game after playing the game many, 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 many times. So my plan is the following. In the next half an hour, I'm going to show you what it looks like when you try to apply some reinforcement learning algorithms to some conjectures. I'm going to show you what you can expect to happen in practice, what are the different outcomes that could happen. And then in the second half um, of this uh, talk today, we will talk more about this optimization algorithm and how these reinforcement alg learning algorithms actually work. All right, so let's see some examples to see what we're actually talking about here. Let's have a look at this particular example here, which is a conjecture in graph theory that says that for every graph, the sum of the eigen largest eigenvalue and the matching number is at least some function of the number of vertices. So this is just going to be a baby example. This is not an open conjecture. It was reputed in 2010, but the smallest country example was some 600 vertices. So let's try to use reinforcement learning to find a smaller explicit country example to this conjecture. Now, if you know graph theory and you know what eigenvalues and matching numbers are, and you think about it for two minutes, you might realize that if this conjecture is true, then it has to be sharp because there is a graph called the star for which we have equality here. But for now, I would like to ask all of you to try to forget everything you know about graph theory, forget everything you know about eigenvalues and matching numbers. And let's completely ignore what the motivation for this conjecture is and where it came from. And let's only focus on how we would go about disproving this conjecture using reinforcement learning if we knew absolutely nothing about mathematics at all. Um, so what is mu of g? Mu of g is the matching number, which is just the size of the largest matching in the graph. But let's not worry um, too much about what the conjectures are. I only would like to focus on the reinforcement learning aspect of these things. OK, so if you see a conjecture like this, and you want to refute it using reinforcement learning, you need to do two things. First, you need to define me a game. You need to phrase this conjecture as a game. And second, you need to define what the score function of this game should be. So how can we phrase this conjecture as a game? Well, the object that we are trying to generate is a graph. There are many ways to generate graphs, but one very simple way would be to go edge by edge. So let's do this for the same thing as we did on the first slide. I'm going to start offering to you each edge of an n-vertex graph one by one. For each edge, you can either choose to accept it or reject it. An n-vertex graph has n times n minus one over two edges. So the game will last this many turns. And once uh, I've offered you each edge, the game is over. Now, what should the score function be of this game? Well, we would like to generate a graph with a small value of lambda 1 plus mu. So an obvious natural choice for a score function would be something like lambda 1 plus mu, which in this case we want to minimize. But that's the same as maximizing minus lambda 1 minus mu. So these are, in some sense, the most obvious ways to, choose, to phrase this conjecture as a game and to define a reward function. So let's just try this. Let's plug it into the reinforcement learning algorithm, let's say for n equals 19. And if you do that and you come back two days later, this is what you're going to find. So in this picture, the blue line represents the best score that the program is able to achieve for this game. You can see in the very beginning, it has no idea what it's doing. It's just generating random graphs. So it gets, it's getting a very bad score. But over time, the score function slowly, slowly decreases. And after 5,000 iterations, the blue line went below the orange dotted line. Now, the orange dotted line simply represents the right-hand side of this inequality. So the fact that eventually the blue line went below the orange dotted line simply means that 
eventually the program was able to find a counterexample to the conjecture. And many times, this is really all there is to this method. You have a conjecture, there's an obvious way to phrase it in the game, there's an obvious choice of a reward function, you plug it in and you just pray that it will work. And if it does, you're great. If it doesn't, well, if it does work, you can also go back, you can open up your neural network and you can see what the counterexample is. In this particular case, this is a, a graph of 19 vertices, which happens to be a counterexample. And strangely enough, I'm pretty sure that this conjecture is actually true up to n equals 17-ish. The smallest counterexample happens to be at n equals 19, which is very strange. And another thing that you can do is you can look even closer and you can, you can look at how the best constructions have evolved over time. And if you do that, you will see something like this. In the beginning, it, was, it had no idea what it was doing. So it was just generating random graphs. Then very quickly, it realized that sparse graphs are the way to go. And eventually, this kind of balanced double star structure has emerged. All right, so this was a baby example. And in some sense, everything just worked out perfectly in this example. There was an obvious way to phrase the conjecture of the game, obvious choice of reward function, and everything just worked perfectly. So this does happen sometimes, and if it happens, then there is really not much to talk about in practice. We just did the obvious thing, and it worked. But today I want to tell you about what other things you can expect to see, what other interesting things you can happen when you try to apply uh, this method in practice. So I picked five examples, and I picked them in such a way that in each of them, something slightly different has happened just to illustrate all the different things that could you can encounter when you're trying to apply this method in practice. In each of them, we are going to disprove some open conjecture. Well, four out of five of them, we are going to succeed in doing so. And each of them will illustrate slightly different things about this method. Adam, can I just ask, um, mm -hmm. so in this example, you don't have any feedback kind of along the road. So you're playing your game, you get you have no idea what you're doing and then at the end you get your score yeah that's right um, so in many cases there's really no way to give feedback along the road you could try to uh, give feedback for the partial graphs as well you can give could define the score function lambda one plus mu for the partial graph that you're constructing in some cases it helps in some cases it doesn't and it's very hard to predict for which problems it helps or not i usually just try both approaches for most problems and um, it's just very hard to predict which one is better in general all right so let's see a couple more examples just so we get a feel for what's going on here the second example is going to be very very similar to the first one again we have, there's a conjecture that says for every graph something called the proximity and distance eigenvalues sum is always positive once again, let's completely ignore what these two values are. Let's focus only on disproving this using reinforcement learning. So how can we do this? Well, phrasing, phrasing it as a game can be done in the exact same way as before. And actually, the score function can be almost the same as before. The only thing we need to change is we need to change lambda 1 plus mu and replace it by pi plus delta. Otherwise, we can use the exact same program and we can try running it for n equals 30. Now, the interesting thing is if you happen, if you run it, this is what you're going to see. So this picture here is the best construction that the program was able to find for n equals 30. The value of pi plus data in this particular example is something like 0 0.4. But if you look back at the conjecture, that the conjecture was that pi plus data is always positive, so the fact that here the value of pi plus data is 0 0.4 simply means that this graph here is not actually a counterexample to the conjecture. So reinforcement learning wasn't able to disprove the conjecture by itself. But in some sense, this is perfectly fine because as soon as you take a picture like this and you put it on a tray and you take it to any undergraduate mathematician, it will be completely obvious what kind of graphs one should try if you're looking for a counterexample to this conjecture, right? You just take this graph, 
you start increasing the number of petals in this flower, you make these two pads a bit longer. And it turns out if you start playing uh, with things like this, there's really no way that you will not eventually find a counterexample to conjecture because already something very simple like this, if you have enough leaves in that one specific spot, this is already a counterexample to the conjecture. So this is something that happens very often that reinforcement learning is simply not powerful enough to get us all the way to a counterexample, but it gives us enough insight to get us 99% of the way there. And with a little bit of human insight, it's very easy to generalize these pictures and find an actual counterexample. All right. The third example is just to illustrate that this method has absolutely nothing to do with graphs. So any problem that can be phrased as a finite sequence of finite decisions can be approached in the exact same way. So let's have a look at this particular question in linear algebra here. Um, the question is, how large can a permanent of a binary matrix be if we assume it doesn't contain a 312 pattern of ones? So 3, 1, 2 pattern is something like in this picture here, where dark squares denote ones and white squares denote zeros. So the kind of stuff that's not allowed is a configuration of black squares like in this picture here. The question is, how large can the permanent of the matrix be? So Brady and Seo had a guess. They said, the best thing to do is that just the most obvious thing, take the three main diagonals and the leftmost column, you can believe me, you can check that this doesn't contain a 312 copy of black squares. And you can believe me that if you calculate the permanent of this matrix, you get some kind of Fibonacci number. All right. So now the question is how do we attack this using reinforcement learning? Well, you can phrase it as a game in a, same, in a very similar way as we did with graphs. Instead of offering the edges one by one, we are just going to offer the entries of the matrix in some order. For each entry, the player can decide to put a zero there or to put a one there. Now the better question is, what should the reward function be in this kind of problem? Um, there's no obvious correct answer here. The reward function somehow has to take into account the permanent of the matrix but you also want to make sure that the result doesn't contain any 312 pattern of ones. So there are a couple of ways to do this. One pretty natural way to me to do this is to define the reward function to be the permanent of the resulting matrix minus some kind of penalty for each individual copy of a 312 in the resulting construction. So if you do it this way, you really need to make sure that the penalty here is big enough. Because otherwise, what happens is that the program will realize that it's beneficial to include some copies of 312s because the gain you get in the permanent offsets the loss that we get through this penalty function. But as long as the penalty you give is big enough, this approach does work. And it turns out that the best constructions are actually something a bit more complicated than what was in the conjecture. And one pretty cool thing about the sequence here is if you look at just the initial segment here, you see this numbers 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 120. And when I first saw 120, I was 100% sure that I was just not finding the best construction. But then I did, went back and I started doing some maths and proving some structure about the best constructions. And I managed to make a computer proof work. And it turns out 120 is indeed the correct value there. So this sequence of permanence does have this really, really bizarre initial statement that's written here. OK, so at this point, I should point out that there are various limitations to this approach. So if you are faced with a problem where you are giving a reward only at the very end, because there is no sensible way to give rewards throughout the game, then that approach is not going to scale very, very well because you're going to play a game for n square steps if you're generating a graph edge by edge and you're only giving a reward at the very edge, very, very end of the game. Uh, that's going to get harder and harder for um, the program to learn. We will talk a bit more about this later as well. Another limitation can be the score function. And in this particular case, uh, calculating the permanence is definitely the bottleneck of the whole thing because. Calculating the, per calculating the permanent is not 
something that can be done in polynomial time. So if you want to go above n equals 20-ish, getting data, getting calculating permanence is what the program will spend most of this time on. So if you want to attack this problem and you go above, say, n equals 20, you definitely will want to choose an algorithm that's less wasteful with data than reinforcement learning is. All right, so let's see a fourth example. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yes, um, please. Could you kind of contrast the difference in the approach which you took? With, you, you didn't disallow three, one, two sequences. Instead, you just penalized them harshly. Could you talk about what would have happened if you had just completely disallowed them and why that wouldn't have been as good an approach? Uh, I tried that as well, actually, and it does work. It does learn. In practice, it just didn't perform as well for some reason. And I'm really not sure what the reason is. Um, but in general, in practice, I found that many times it's good to allow the program to go into forbidden territory as well and just put a deep slope there. So like the further you go from the allowed uh, domain, the bigger penalty you will gain. I found that in practice, this just works usually a little bit better. But again, this is very problem dependent. For this particular problem, this was the case, but I don't have a very good explanation to why that was the case. Okay, thanks. Adam, do I understand correctly that the conjecture is actually false even for n equals four or something? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was just totally false. Yes, it was just completely false. I, I think it happens many times that people just make conjectures that they check for n equals two and three, and they just assume it must be true for, yeah. Uh, maybe it was more of a guess than a conjecture. Let's just say it that way. Um, yeah. It would have been better if the conjecture was that it's always a power of two, <laughs> then it would have been more interesting to disprove it, but still, the counterexamples are very interesting. It's very interesting here. Okay, so so far we've seen three examples where um, it was very obvious how to phrase uh, the conjecture as a game. So let's see an example where this is definitely not so obvious anymore. So here's a conjecture from Collins. It says that for any three, we can associate two polynomials, and the conjecture says something about the coefficients of these two polynomials. So let's focus on how to phrase this conjecture as a game. You could say, let's just, just do the same thing as before. We are generating a graph, and then you have to make sure that the graph is a three, and you have to make sure that in this three, the coefficients do whatever the conjecture says. So you could say that the reward function will have two components. The first one will make sure that the graph is close to being a three. So it will measure something like how many edges does it have, how many cycles it has, and so on. And the second one measures whatever the conjecture is talking about. So you could do this. It's definitely doable. And it's actually related to the question that was just a minute ago. In practice, whenever possible, you want to avoid reward functions that consist of multiple components. Why exactly? I'm not sure. In practice, it just doesn't seem to work very well. So if possible, you would like to get rid of either F1 or F2. And that will mean in practice that your program will just learn much, much better than if it has two components that are responsible for teaching two separate things to the program. So how can we eliminate, eliminate some components of these reward functions in practice? Well, F2 is responsible for the conjecture itself. We are not going to be able to remove it. So we should focus on trying to remove F1, which is measuring how close to being a tree we are. Um, so this is true for many conjectures in combinatorics and graph theory that I encountered where the conjecture speaks about some specific type of graphs, like trees or planar graphs, or so on. The way to remove this F1 is, of course, to generate a tree directly. So instead of teaching a neural network how to generate trees, 
it would be easier if you could only allow the neural network to generate trees and nothing else. No, so I'm saying that if the reward function, so there's a question here that um, am I saying that the reward function of the form f1 minus f2 is good, but f1 plus f2 is bad? No, I'm saying that having multiple components is bad and we should avoid it whenever possible. The previous example was also a case where we had two components, but there for some reason, multiple components, the two component version worked better. But in general, I think that is not the case. So in general, if possible, we should try to remove some of the components. I'm really not sure why in the previous example, it was good to have this extra penalty function. Okay, so how can we generate a tree directly? Well, um, many times when you don't want to generate a structure like trees, planar graphs, in the literature, there are already some known bijections between these objects that you want to generate and some finite sequences of finite decisions. So finite words from some finite alphabets. In the case of trees, there's this thing called the proofer code, which is going to be very, very helpful. So instead of generating a graph, it's very helpful to generate a proofer code directly. So proof for code is just a bijection between trees and words of length n minus two from an alphabet of size n. So instead of generating a graph edge by edge, we are going to generate this proof for code digit by digit. This way, each game will last n minus two turns, and in each turn, we can make n possible decisions. Ah, so back to the previous question of why is it good here in this case to remove one of the components, and in the previous case, it wasn't. Maybe. It is because there are so many fewer trees than normal graphs. So you're actually gaining a lot by restricting yourself to generating only trees. And that already helps speed up the program quite a lot. Maybe that's a potential answer. OK, but in your case, if you remove one of the components, this approach will work much better in this case. and. You can choose the obvious reward function. If you do that, you will find a counter example. All right, so let's see one more example where it's not so easy to remove these components. So here I have to give a little bit of background. Don't worry too much about it if you're not interested. Uh, I'm just going to walk you through what this next conjecture is going to say. So for any graph and n vertices, we can also see it some n by n matrices, for example, the adjacency matrix. But here we will care about something called the distance Laplacian. So people care a lot about the spectral properties of this matrix. And in particular, people care a lot about what happens if two matrices have the same distance Laplacian eigenvalues, what other properties must they share? So there was a survey recently that talked about what properties are preserved if two, matrices, if two graphs have the same distance Laplacian eigenvalues. It shows that. They don't need to have the same number of edges. They don't need to have the same diameter, but they do need to have the same binary index or the same number of connected components and complement and so on. But one property that was not known in the survey is this property called transmission regularity. So the question is, can we find two graphs, G and H, so that they have the same eigenvalues, but one of them is transmission regular and the other one is not? So that's, that's going to be our task that we will try to solve. So transmission regularity just means something very similar to regularity, except instead of degrees, you will look at distances. So graph is transmission regular. If for any point, you look at the sum of distances to all other points, you will find that this number is constant for each vertex. OK, so imagine that you phrase this as a game somehow, and you constructed two graphs. How, what should the reward function of the resulting pair of graphs be? Well, most obvious thing is going to be pretty bad because it will have three components now. Um, you need to make sure that the two graphs have the same eigenvalues. You need to make sure that the first graph is transmission regular, and you need to make sure that the second one is not transmission regular. So, this is kind of an obvious natural choice of the score function, but it has three components. And it's very difficult to imagine how you could get rid of any of these three components. So if you wanted to get rid of F1, 
then you would need to find to generate directly graphs which have the same spectrum, which is not something I can figure out how to do. If you're going to get rid of F2, you need to figure out how to generate graphs that are transmission regular directly. There might be a way to do it. If you want to find some good way to encode transmission regular graphs as finite sequences from some finite alphabet, but I have no idea how to do this. And the same for F3. So this case where we have a three part score function, which usually means it's pretty bad. And there's really no way to get rid of any of these three components. So in practice, to me, usually this just means that I really shouldn't expect the reinforcement learning algorithm to work particularly well for this problem. So the only hope we have left is that there is going to be some kind of counterexample on a reasonably small value of n, because if the sm smallest counterexample is going to be two graphs on 30 vertices, then I don't expect that this algorithm be will be able to find it. And probably some other algorithms are much better suited for this problem. In this particular case, we do get lucky. There are two graphs on 12 vertices each, which have the same spectrum. So we do end up disproving the conjecture. But this was really just pure luck. If the smallest counterexample had been a bit bigger, I don't think I would have found it with this method. All right. So just to finish off, let's have one more example. And then we are going to do a break. So at this point, you might be saying, OK, this is great. We can generate finite constructions. But actually, most interesting uh, conjectures in mathematics are about infinite things. So is there any way to attack infinite conjectures using this method? And the answer is, well, yeah, it's definitely more difficult. But sometimes it is possible. So let's do one example where it is possible to do that. So we will look at this conjecture of Erdős from 62 that says, take a graph, count the number of four tuples of points that are all connected to each other, plus count the number of four tuples of points so that no two of them are connected to each other. The conjecture of Erdős was that this sum is minimized asymptotically by random graphs where you flip a coin for each edge independently from each other, and you include an edge if you flip heads and you don't include it, it stills. So this was a famous conjecture. It was for 27 years until a breakthrough result by Thomason disproved it. And he found a brilliant construction that shows that this conjecture is false. And he used some uh, finite geometries. And it's an absolutely brilliant paper to read. So we really wanted to find a way to disprove this conjecture using only reinforcement learning. And I started working on this problem together with Glenn Jure, who is a brilliant computer science professor from Belgium. And together, we found a way to do this. So in general, if you're faced with an infinite problem, there are two main ways you can go about trying to disprove this. The first one is something very similar to what we did in the second example. You just ignore the infinite part completely. You just pick one large value of n, try to find the best construction for that value of n, and you just hope that this best construction gives you enough insight so that you will be able to generalize this construction kind of by hand, just by looking at it and observing some properties of it. Unfortunately, for this particular conjecture and for conjectures that are like this, it often happens that the best construction is some kind of algebraic construction and it's really, really, really hard to look at some fixed graph on 50 vertices just with your eyes and spot what this algebraic construction is. So I tried that, and it just I was just completely unsuccessful. So there's also a second way to do it, which is somehow find a way to reduce this infinite conjecture to a finite conjecture. Now, this very much depends on the field that you're in and what problem you're working on. In graph theory, there are a bunch of cheap tricks that you can use to reduce an infinite conjecture to a finite conjecture. And one of these cheap tricks is called uh, blowing up a graph, which is just the same as saying, I'm not going to construct an infinite sequence of graphs. I'm only going to construct one finite graph. And I'm going to take a direct product of this graph with a complete graph of number vertices. And I will just let m go to infinity. So 
turns out if you do that, it's great because the value of this function of k4 of the blow up plus k4 of the complement of the blow up only depends on properties of g. So you can use this limit object here as a reward function, which can be calculated using a very simple formula that can be worked out. And you can just simply use this as a reward function, plug it into the reinforcement learning algorithm, and you do end up finding a counterexample to conjecture. So to me, this really shows that um, if Erdős had made this conjecture today, it definitely wouldn't have been open for 27 years. It could have, with uh, our methods, disproved it within a matter of days very easily. Now, for all the previous examples, I always showed you what the counterexample was. Once you start working on problems like this, this kind of stops making sense. The problem is that, well, I can show you the counterexample. It looks something like this. I have absolutely no idea what this graph is. It's not regular. It's not symmetric. It just happens to be the smallest counterexample to this conjecture that we could find. So this is one of the big drawbacks of this method to me, at least. Many times, even if you succeed in disproving a conjecture with this method, the only information you get is this one bit of information that the conjecture is false, but you're not getting any real insight as to why the conjecture is false. Whereas if you look at the Thomason paper, you can actually understand why conjecture is false and you can start building on it. Whereas if I only show you this particular counterexample, it's going to be very, very difficult to start building on it and do some interesting math with it. So to me, that's one of the big negative aspects of using this method to solve conjectures. Um, okay, so I think these are the examples I wanted to show you. And in the next half of the course, we are going to continue with reinforcement learning algorithms and talk about how they actually work. So maybe this would be a good point for a quick break. Does anybody have any questions in the interim? Yeah, I have a question. So thanks, Aaron. It was, was, was fantastic. It was really great. I have a question about the second example where you couldn't find the count example, but you sort of got an idea of how the count example would work. Like, why didn't it find? What was the obstruction that it couldn't find the counter example? Is it that you don't have enough data, or is it that your reward function is somehow constructed that you couldn't, you know, you didn't converge? I don't know how these uh, reinforcement learning algorithms work. Is it like is it like an optimization? Algorithm, so you were stuck in some minimum that you couldn't get out, or what? What? What was the obstruction there? Um, that's a good question. So, I think these algorithms are just really, really slow, um, and I. It might be that for n equals thirty, this particular graph is the best graph. I'm really not sure. So, my I I, I think the reason it couldn't find a counterexample is because the smallest counterexample is just way larger so oh okay so this is actually the smallest counter example i know for oh, okay because okay. i'm 200 vertices okay. and this method just doesn't work for graphs about 100 vertices at all oh i didn't i didn't appreciate that that it was not the same number of, of vertices that yeah, we yeah, found. yeah okay okay exactly yeah. yeah okay thanks and maybe another comment is that you're using a very like it's in some sense like a, a totally generic architecture so like if you deeply cared about this conjecture, then you could probably like work out a more complicated architecture that might, I'm, I'm not sure. Right, so that's a very good point, Jordi. So we will talk about it in the second half. Um, my whole goal with this project was to have one very generic program that I can just throw at a bunch of different conjectures. So I was purposefully avoiding using any speci special architectures that take any kind of symmetry into account. If you had one favorite conjecture in mind and you wanted to pick the best reinforcement learning method and best setup for that one specific uh, conjecture, then you would do something things very different from what we are going to do in the second half of the course now. I'm just curious with the first example, with the, the right-hand side, for example, is there is there any obvious replacement for the right-hand side that still has a chance of being correct? Or like, uh, would your methods suggest anything like that? Ah, that's a good question. So I suppose what you could do is you could run this reinforcement learning for n equals 50, and you could see what the best graph is for n equals 50. And maybe that would suggest some kind of 
a new conjecture. I'll be honest, I, I really didn't think much about this at all. Um, to me, once I disproved the conjecture, I was done with it and I moved on to the next one. I didn't think about how we could go about replacing it, how we could go about fixing it at all. Right. I guess it was refuted in 2010, right? So I wonder if like there hasn't been a replacement to it of any kind that you're aware of anyway, I guess. I, I don't think it's a, this is a very famous conjecture at all. This is just something okay. someone wrote down. Maybe this is true. Um, so I, I don't think people care so much about how to fix this conjecture, to be honest. But somehow, if you did have a potential fix, it would make a hell of a lot of sense to rerun your algorithm and make sure it's not trivially false. <laughs> yes. It, it would be very embarrassing if I suggested the replacement it was, and it was false for n equals four. <laughs> okay, so yeah, welcome back. Now in the second half, I will tell you a little bit about how these reinforcement learning algorithms actually work. And that's going to be the tricky part because this is definitely the part that I'm not an expert in. So if I tell you something that doesn't make any sense, or that sounds strange, then please ask questions because probably the reason it doesn't make sense is because I'm saying something wrong. So our goal here in the second half is going to be to find the best reinforcement learning algorithm for our purposes, which is to refute conjectures in mathematics. So when it comes to reinforcement learning algorithms, they come in two main buckets. We have so-called value-based methods, and we have so-called policy-based methods, and these are very different animals. So value-based methods, they learn to evaluate positions. So if you have a value-based algorithm, it could look at the chess position at the chessboard, and it would say something like, in this position, white is up plus 5.6, and he's likely to win. Whereas in a policy-based method, a such an algorithm would look at the chessboard, and it would say something like, I have absolutely no idea who is winning in this position, but I'm very confident that the correct move is king to e2. Nowadays, there are also many, many methods that mix these two things together. These are called actor-critic methods that both have value-based and policy-based aspects, but we'll not talk about them today. So our task is going to be to figure out which algorithm and which bucket is more suitable for our purposes. So let's talk about value-based methods first. Let's understand how they go about solving uh, games. So when you try to attack a, a game using a value-based method, you regard the game as a sequence of states, actions, rewards. So a state is just a position in the game, which describes everything that's currently happening. Action is what button you decided to press in that particular position. And reward is how much intermediate, immediate reward you get in that specific button press. Of course, in our problems, many times we give rewards only at the very end of the game, but there is no reason if you're using a value-based method why you couldn't be why you couldn't give rewards throughout the game as well. So of course, we want to have a long-term strategy. We don't just want to pick a greedy action that it gives us the best immediate reward. We want to plan ahead in the future. Every game that we are going to consider here is going to be a Markov process, which means the next state should only depend on the state that we are currently in and what action we decided to take right now. This dependence can and will be probabilistic as well. And how we take our actions is also going to be probabilistic in practice. All right, so if you want to understand a game, the kind of variable we would like to understand is something like this G sub T, which describes how much reward you're going to receive after time T in this game. Now this value G sub T depends of course on the game and how you're playing the game, what strategy policy you're using to play the game. But generally it can be written as the reward you get at time T plus one plus time T plus two plus so on and so forth. Now, g sub t can also be written as r sub t plus one, just plus g sub t plus one, but this equation is not really helping us because this just means in order to calculate g sub t, you would need to be able to estimate g sub t plus one as well. So g sub t can be either a number or a random variable, depending on whether there is a randomness in the strategy and the game or not. 
So how can we go about understanding this value or variable G sub T? Well, the way value functions, uh, the way um, value-based methods do this is by defining something called a value function. So recall that the policy or a strategy is just a map from states, positions in the game to actions. This map can be probabilistic. Now, once we have fixed a policy, so we've decided how we're going to play the game, we can define the value of a given state, assuming that we play according to policy P, the policy prime to be the expected amount of reward we are going to get in the future if we are currently in the state S. So this is the value of a state given that we are currently paying with policy prime. So we would like, if possible, to understand this value function for all states. So the reason this would be good is if we can calculate this V of S given policy pi, is because we could just plug in the starting position of the game to this formula, then we would get a value of the starting position, and that would represent how good our current policy pi is at playing at the game. And that would be an easy way to compare different policies and just choose the best one. So we would very much like to calculate this function or estimate and understand how it behaves. The question is, how can you calculate this function in practice? Well, there are a couple obvious ways to do this. You could say something like, just play the game many, many times. And every time you encounter a state S, you just write down how much reward you got afterwards in the future. So that's one way to do it. And the other way is to not do simulations, but rather to do something explicit. The value of any given state can be easily calculated from the values of all possible successor states. You can just write down simple linear equation. You have a linear equation for each state, and you can just solve this big system of linear equations efficiently with the computer, and you will, you will be able to calculate the value function of every state. Now, there's a common problem with both of these approaches, which is that the state space or the collection of all possible states can be gigantic. It can be huge or it can be continuous for something very simple like the card pool game. It would be a continuous state space and it would be very difficult to discretize it in any sensible way. So because of this, both of these methods are bound to fail and we will not be able to estimate the value function like this. So this is one of the main ideas to me about reinforcement learning of how are we going to overcome this issue that we cannot reasonably estimate this value function. And the way value-based methods do that, um, so the game I said is a card pool game, which is just, um, uh, one of the simplest uh, toy problems for reinforcement learning is when you have want to balance a uh, rod on your hand and you can only move left or right and you have to make sure that the rod doesn't fall off of your cart or your hand. But uh, for most problems, the state space is going to be gigantic. Um, okay, so how can we fix this problem? Well, the way reinforcement learning algorithms do this is by we are going to flip the table around and look at this definition from the opposite view. So here we said we fixed a policy pi and we define the value of a state given policy pi. Now we are going to do the exact opposite of this. Instead of fixing a policy pi first, we are going to fix a value function and derive a policy from the value function. So what does this mean? Well, we fix a function that's going to be a neural network that takes as input a state and outputs a value of a given state. Initially, this is just going to be a random function because we have no idea about the game. But slowly, slowly, we are going to start improving this value function and eventually it will converge, hopefully, to the correct value function of the game. So what does correct or optimal value function mean? An optimal value function, the value of any state is going to represent how much expected reward can we get from the state, assuming we play according to the optimal policy. 
All right. So previously we started from a policy and we derived a value function from it. Now we start with a value function. How can we derive a policy from it? If I give you the correct value function of a game, how can you go about playing the game? Well, it's actually very easy. If you know the value of every possible state of the game, then you just look at all possible values of all possible successor states, and you just pick the largest one, and you just keep taking greedy moves. And that's going to be a perfect way to play the game, assuming that you started with the correct value function. So this is called an exploitation move in reinforcement learning. You just take a greedy step according to what you perceive to be a correct approximate value function. But of course, in practice, we don't have the correct value function. So you want to keep improving it and exploring new things. So because we can never ever be certain that the value function we have is the correct value function, we can never be certain that we've already found the best policy, the best way to play the game. We have to continuously make some suboptimal moves. So we have to continuously explore some moves that we haven't tried yet, maybe, or we are not so sure about. It is called exploration. So as you can see, exploitation guarantees that you get the highest possible score that you can currently guarantee. And exploration will usually result in some suboptimal scores. But we do need to do this exploration because we can never, ever be certain that we've already found the best strategy, the best policy in the game. But these exploitation and exploration are going, to, are going to be opposite ends of the same stick. So there's going to be a big issue here about how are you going to, ex, uh, how are you going to balance these two things. If you do too much exploration, that you're not, then you're not going to learn. And if you're doing too much exploitation, that you're going, then you're going to be stuck in doing the same thing over and over again. And you're also not going to be improve, improving. All right. Uh, so that's roughly a summary of how value-based methods work. We start with some value-based, uh, some value estimate function that takes as input a state, outputs a value of a state. So this is going to be our neural network. We want to continuously improve our value function. So we will do exploitation moves to get high scores, and we will do exploration moves, say, epsilon proportion of the time to test some new moves. By doing so, we are going to gather new experiences and we are going to improve a value function based on these experiences. OK, so how do we actually do this last step? How are we improving our value estimate function? Well, that kind of depends on the algorithm that you're using. In the algorithm called DPQ networks, what we are doing is essentially the simplest possible thing, which is called temporal difference learning. So, Temporal difference learning is just a very fancy way of saying we are currently in a state S, make a prediction as to what should happen now, then do a step, and now you're one step in the future, and now you have a better idea of what you should have said one second ago. So adjust your prediction according to this new insight that you gained from making a step. OK, so what does this do? So you're currently in a state S, and you believe that taking some action A is the best thing we can do here. Now you make a prediction as to how much future forward to expect you get from the current state. And the prediction is going to be, of course, the value of S according to this value function. That's the best prediction you got. So now you go ahead, you actually make this step A, you get some kind of reward by doing so, R sub t plus one, and you ended up in a new state S prime. So now you're one step in the future, and now you have a better idea as to, as to what you should have said one second ago. Now you can see that the correct reward that you should have predicted one second ago was actually r sub t plus one plus the value of the current state, which is how much reward you expect to get from now on in the future. So we had for state S, we have made a prediction V sub S, and now we have an observation, which is closer to the truth, which is r sub t plus 1 plus v of s prime. So we are going to fit this observation to the state s, which in practice just means take a small step of gradient descent in the space of all the edges of the neural network so that you would change the value of v of s to something that's a bit closer to 
R sub t plus one plus V of S prime. So that's kind of the main vanilla uh, uh, algorithms of so-called deep Q networks. Um, so I should at this point probably say that um, Why, so there's a question, why do you want to take a small step in this very last uh, learning step? Why don't you just replace V of S by R sub T plus one plus V of S prime? It's a good question. So in reinforcement learning, you always want to take tiny, tiny steps because it's definitely not the case that the second estimate of R sub T plus one plus V of S prime is actually the correct value. It's a little bit more correct probably than V of S, but you don't want to jump directly through it. Um, if you do that, that's the equivalent of uh, doing reinforcement learning algorithm with a big, big learning rate. And what ends up happening, happening is that you will converge very, very quickly, but you will keep bouncing over um, the best constructions and you will end up with something that's extremely unstable. You'll keep improving, forgetting, improving, forgetting, and so on. So you want to make sure that you really take small steps in everything that you're doing. But there's another question here, R sub T plus one could be stochastic. Uh, it could very much be stochastic, um, but so in all of the games that we are considering here, R sub T plus one is not stochastic. So I actually haven't tried deep, the deep two networks on any uh, games where this reward function was stochastic. But from what I've seen in the literature, they just do the same thing, even when R sub T plus one is a random variable. I'm guessing that in that case, this just by taking these small steps still averages out and it's fine. Um, I haven't seen any different treatment for when this reward function is stochastic or versus when it's not stochastic. Adam, can I um, just ask quickly, on it, I think it's the previous slide. There was just an R8 that I didn't understand. But there we go. Prob state space is continuous. Very ah, right. Sorry. Oh, OK. So this is your, your example again. OK. Is yeah. So sorry. I, here I just mentioned this game called uh, Carpool, which I didn't write here. Um, it's just a very simple game. In re reinforcement learning, it's a very easy toy problem that you will always want to test your reinforcement learning items at. And in, even if it's in this very simple problem where you're trying to balance a stick by going left and right, the state space has is something like R to the eight. But in general, the only thing I was saying here is that state space can be very, very large. It could be something like R to the eight even, or it could be just something discrete, but huge. So in either way, both of these options that I described here are just not going to work because there are too many states if you just play random games, you're not going to encounter 99% of the, the states even once by doing so. And the second option also doesn't work because you will simply have a way too large number of equations that you have to solve. And so maybe just uh, one more question. So if, if so let's say in this graph, in, in the graph example that you were showing us earlier, so we've got a whole, so let's say a state at the end of the game is a, kind of zero one sequence saying whether I took an edge or not. Do I imagine this is kind of like um, encoded as some basis of some sum of basis vectors inside R to the N choose two or something? Um, I'm not sure I understand what you mean. I'm just trying to imagine, so we're learning this value function on some vector space. Mm -hmm. um, well, I assume we're learning on a vector space because it's given by a neural net. So what is this vector space in practice? How do I imagine this vector space in practice? Uh, so the state space um, is going to be in the graph case, just um, the vector space of dimension entries two or F2. Um, exactly. But Right, so it, it depends on the problem as well. If you're generating um, trees, then uh, it's not over F2 anymore, it's over mod N. Okay, thank right. you, yeah. Yeah. Adam, I had one more question. Um, yes, please. These rewards, like R, t, R sub T, 
um, what would they be in like the first example that you presented of building a graph? Right, so that's a very good question. So how do you give partial rewards in our case when we are this, when we are doing these conjectures? And the answer is that in many cases, there's really no good way to do that. So one thing that you could try, and this was what I tried when I used these methods, is to define R sub T plus one to be the value of the current partial graph minus the value of the previous partial graph, where the value is lambda one plus mu of the graph. So that's kind of the obvious way thing to try. And in some cases, it just worked pretty well. In many cases, this, this didn't work at all. And I think it's very, very problem dependent on whether you can actually get away with doing something naive like that. Also depends on like, so with eigenvalues, it's not really the case that uh, the final graphs eigenvalue has anything to do with the partial graphs eigenvalue. So it's not a very good thing to try, but for some problems, it does make more sense than for others. For example, for penalty functions, when you want to avoid some copies of 312s, there it made a very sensible thing that in every step you gain, you gather the penalties based on how many copies of 312s you have so far collected. So there it was a very natural thing and it actually worked reasonably well, if I remember correctly. But for some other problems, it just didn't make any sense to do it and didn't work very well. Uh -huh. So you've like rigged it so that the, the like sum of the RTs is is the actual objective function that you were presenting in the previous slide exactly uh -huh. yeah, exactly yeah yeah that's right that's exactly it. so you just define it as telescopic sum in a natural way and um but i should say that in all the examples that i showed you we are going to use a different algorithm that's a policy-based algorithm and we are not going to do any snap kind of temporal difference learning like this so this is not really going to be relevant okay thanks I did try this DQN approach for problems, but uh, as I will mention a bit later, um, value-based methods, especially like DQNs like I'm describing here, have some problems that make it a very bad choice for our purposes, which is going to be to try to have one program that you can throw at a hundred different conjectures without thinking and by only modifying small things. So these are not very stable, and there will be some practical issues if you do that. I will mention that in a few minutes. So at this point, I, I only want to mention that this that I described here is just the very basics of deep, deep networks. If you actually go ahead and code this up, you will see that it doesn't work at all. It's going to be extremely unstable. It will learn and forget everything, learn, forget everything, and it will just get absolutely nowhere. So this is a very known thing about deep networks. Today, we understand pretty well why it has its issues and how we can go about fixing it. So we have a much better understanding about how we should go about doing this algorithm. I'm not going to talk about these modifications that you have to do. But I should say that this is a super exciting topic, really cool algorithm. If you want to learn this algorithm, there's a million different uh, resources online. But Many of these resources are absolutely terrible and they teach you wrong things. So at the very end of the talk, I'm going to recommend you two courses, uh, some Coursera courses that to me were more helpful than a hundred other courses and books and resources that I've tried to do. So if I could go back in time and start my learning process by doing those two courses, I would have saved myself a month of headaches by trying to make these value-based methods work. So I'm going to recommend these courses to you at the very end of the talk. All right, but let's move on now and let's get back to what our goal was to do this here. So once we decided that we're going to use reinforcement learning to attack conjectures, we really had two possible paths ahead of us. We could say what Jordi said, we could pick one specific conjecture and try to find the best algorithm and the best setup for that particular conjecture. So that's a completely valid thing to do. And that's absolutely not what I was after. I was after the exact opposite of that. I was looking for a very general setup that I could throw 
at 100 conjectures without changing anything, only the reward function. So in the beginning, I was obsessed by trying to find the best algorithm for this goal. But what I had to realize eventually is that it's not really just about the algorithm, but also about the implementation. And in many cases, implementation mattered much more than the choice of the algorithm. The thing is that when you're implementing something like this, you have to make a million different choices. And all of these tiny, small choices will affect the final performance of the algorithm quite a lot. So even if you restrict yourself to something very simple like generating graphs, you have many, many choices. For example, do you generate a graph edge by edge or vertex by vertex? If you generate a graph edge by edge, you want to offer the edges in some fixed order or maybe in a different order every time, maybe in a random order. Maybe if you offer the edges in a random order, then this will help the network learn to generalize more, or maybe it will just confuse the network. You can also do things like, uh, instead of generating a vertex by vertex, you can also ask the network which edge it would like to add. That would be, again, a very different approach. Some other ideas that you can play with is you could offer edges in batches. You could offer five edges at a time and let the network pick any of these five edges, because this way, each game would last five times less time. So you could get five times more games in the same amount of time. You can more experiences and so on. But of course, each decision would be much more complex then. And another sensible thing to do is to do multiple passes over the edges. This way, the network has some chance of fixing its mistake if it has made some mistake. But of course, the downside is that um, each game would last twice as long in that case. So these are all different decisions that you have to make. And the problem is that if you make wrong decisions here, then you will end up with a reinforcement learning algorithm that's just not learning at all. Now, there are many general reasons why um, some reinforcement learning algorithms might not be performing well, or might, they might not be learning as quickly as we would like them to do. So some of them I've written here. So one is called the sparse rewards problem, which means that we, if you give a reward only at the very end of the game, this means that you play a game for a thousand moves, but you're walking for a thousand moves completely in the dark without any kind of feedback. And this directly ties in with this credit assignment problem, which says that I just played a game for a thousand moves. I got a very good score at the end, but how can I decide which one of my thousand moves was responsible for getting a good or bad score? So these are both problems that whatever reinforcement learning algorithm and setup you choose, it will have to address these issues. Um, there's also this problem called the bad reward design, which comes in many different ways. For example, if in the matrix example, the penalty you give is not large enough, you will end up solving a different problem than what you, what you intended to solve. But it could also be that you define a reward function that's zero almost everywhere and only positive in very few points in which case your algorithm might never ever realize that it's even possible to get a positive score in this game. For example, you could define, you could try to generate regular graphs by giving a point score zero if it's not regular and one if it's regular. And that would be a terrible thing to do because regular graphs are just so scarce that your program will just never accidentally generate one and it will never realize that it's possible to get a positive score in the game. And there's also the explorer exploit dilemma, which we've already talked about. You have to find a way to balance exploring and exploiting in whatever algorithm that you're doing correctly. Now, these are all the theoretical problems that could come up, but there's also one big practical issue, which I've already mentioned a couple of times, which is pictures like this. So with many algorithms and very many implementations when I tried, I kept seeing pictures, seeing pictures like this. You have an agent that learns the game, it gets a high score, it forgets everything, learns again, forgets everything, and so on, and it's just complete chaos. So the main reason why, in practice, this is such a bad picture to see is because there are so many different reasons that can explain why your algorithm is behaving like this. And it can be an absolute pain in the butt to figure out and debug what is actually going on uh, in practice. So the reason is that it could be something very simple, like one of the parameters was wrong, maybe your learning rate was too high. But 
the reasons that explain this picture could be something much, much more complicated. Could be that this particular algorithm is not suited for your problem that you're trying to solve, but it's going to be good for other problems. Or it could be that the reason it's behaving like this is something much more deeper. And you actually have to go into the literature and see if there's some kind of paper that addresses this issue. So because seeing pictures like this is such a huge time sink in practice, I can already tell you that whatever algorithm you're going to look, be looking for, if your goal is to throw it at 100 conjectures without thinking too much about it, you definitely want an algorithm that's as stable as possible because you absolutely do not want to spend days and days and days trying to debug why this picture on the previous slide is happening. So as we've say, seen already, there are a million different choices to make during implementation. There are many different algorithms. You're not going to be able to test every combination here, but it makes sense to look for an algorithm that works pretty well across the board. And this is the point where I can save you a lot of time. I can tell you, I've tried a bunch of different things and I can try you what is a pretty good general setup to use. And this algorithm will be the cross entropy method. So the whole thing about the cross entropy method is just, it's the most stable algorithm, reinforcement learning algorithm out there. So the main advantage is that we'll never see this picture if you use cross entropy method, which I cannot emphasize enough how much of a blessing it is in practice. <laughs> Um, it's definitely not the strongest reinforcement learning algorithm out there, but as a baseline method, it's a perfect thing to try. So the cross entropy method is not a value-based method. It's a policy-based method. So everything I've told you before about learning, it's just not going to work because we will not have a value function. So let's have a look at how the cross entropy method works. There's not going to be a value function. So we will use the neural network to take an input state and the output is going to be the probability that we should take an edge or not take an edge. So it, the output is always going to be a probability distribution on the possible actions that we can take. So how do we go about generating graphs with this method? Well, first you take an empty graph and a pointer to the very first edge and you input this empty graph and the pointer into the neural network. The neural network spits out a probability distribution on whether we should take the first edge or not. It could say something like, I think you should take the first edge with probability 0 0.7. You sample the first edge according to this probability distribution. Let's say you ended up taking the first edge. So now you have a graph with one edge. You plug it right back into the neural network. And now you add a pointer to the second edge. And you ask the neural network to predict the probability that we should take the second edge or not. You sample from it, you plug it right back in, and you keep plugging it back in until you have made a decision for each possible edge, and you ended up with some kind of final construction. So because this is a random construction, um, the way to look at it is that the neural network induces a probability distribution on the set of all and vertex graphs or on the set of all objects that we're trying to generate. Now the question is, how do we learn in polyspace method? So we cannot do temporal difference learning, but which we did before, because we don't have a value function. So every polyspace method solves this issue in a different way. The cross entropy method does something very simple. It says, we are going to learn in the simplest possible way. We are going to sample 1,000 points from this probability distribution. Or in other words, we are going to play 1,000 games according to this neural network. Now, we calculate the score of all of these 1,000 games that we played. We throw away the bottom 900, and we only keep the top 100. And now what we're going to do is we're going to pre pretend that in all, this, all the situations and all the states that these top 100 games encountered, we are going to pretend that they have made the correct decision in each of these um, states. So we are going to look at all, every single state's action pair that they've encountered during these top 100 constructions. And we're going to fit the neural network on these state action pairs. So 
that's what we're going to do. So you will see how to implement this in practice tomorrow. Um, in practice, what just means is that if in a state you predicted that we should take an edge with some probability, and one of the state action pairs is that in this state, it's good to take this edge, then you just want to increase this probability that in the next round, you, um, in the next time you encounter this state, you're going to take this edge. So it's, from an implementation point, this is the exact same thing as before. You're just going to fit the state and the value one, but the loss function you want to choose is something called a cross entropy, a loss function. Uh, that's just from a practical point of view, that makes more sense. Okay, so that's just the simplest version of the cross entropy method. And that's actually, this basic method is was what was used in the first five examples that I showed you. So in terms of implementation, so I've experimented with a bunch of different things, but I found that it actually doesn't really matter how, in what order you offer the edges and random order was almost always a terrible thing to do. So you just want to fix one order of the edges and you want to offer them one by one. Now, in terms of the inputs, you will see tomorrow in the implementation and the workshop, you will have two um, inputs, one of them corresponding to the partial construction that we've constructed so far, and the second input that corresponds to uh, a pointer to the edge or next decision that we are currently considering. Now, in terms of architecture, because we're looking for a very general approach here, I just took a simple, fully connected uh, dense neural network with three layers. But again, of course, if you want something specific for one problem, this would be a very simple thing to improve. You could replace the network with something that takes the symmetries of your problem into account. Now, one more thing that you will see tomorrow in the implementation is that we've changed the algorithm a little bit. We're not just learning from the top 10% and repeating the process over and over again, but we are going to keep the top small number of percent to survive for the next iteration. So we don't just want to throw away all the best constructions, um, but it helps make it even more stable uh, to keep the best ones around for a bit longer. All right. So this algorithm is what was used in the first five examples. For the last one, we had to do a little bit more, and there are a couple small improvements we have noticed with measure A. I'm just going to quickly glance over them. The problem with saying that these are improvements is because is, is that it's very, very problem dependent. So you could say that adding some local search helps, but for some reason, some problems is actually hurting you because you will be more likely to just immediately get stuck in some local optima. So all of these improvements, uh, the three I mentioned here are improvements in general, but it's very, very much problem dependent on what works for what problems here. All right, so I think that's all I wanted to say about how these different reinforcement learning algorithms work. Just to finish off, I do want to mention some recent work, of course, by Big group of these mind and Mark Lecambi and Andra Shuhas and your our very own uh, Jordi, of course, uh, who did something very similar. They got some super nice results in rep theory and topology. They did something a bit different. They use machine learning to predict whether one parameter is a function of other parameters. And their goal was not to have a generalist approach to disprove conjectures, but rather their goal was to elevate top mathematicians and assist their expertise with machine learning, kind of an AI assistant mathematical discovery. And that's all I wanted to say. So as promised, I put up these two courses that I really recommend here. Uh, these are both on this website called Udemy, and they're made by a guy called uh, Phil Tabor, who I believe is a physicist or used to be a physicist, and now he is left academia. So if you want to learn these methods, I can definitely recommend these two courses. You can do them in one weekend if you spend the whole weekend on it. I don't think they're free. I think they cost like 10 bucks, but maybe if you ask Jordi very nicely, then he'll pay for it. Um, 
project, yeah. So in terms of future goals, of course, the most exciting future of direction is to find some other ways to use machine learning in mathematics, because it's very obvious that there are still lots and lots of low hanging fruits in this area. Most of the interesting ways to use machine learning in mathematics have simply not been explored so far. So it would be very exciting to see what any of you can do with RL or with other methods in mathematics. And I'm going to stop here. So thank you very much for listening. And let's know if you have any questions as well. Thanks a lot, Adam, for this very beautiful, inspiring talk. Questions? I have a question. So Adam, in the, you keep the top 5% between generations. During this process, are you just training one network? Like what does keeping the top 5% mean? So I am only training one network. Uh, that's actually a very interesting uh, question that someone else also suggested recently, is you could have a different network responsible for each edge of the graph. Uh, so that's something that you could try to do. Uh, I haven't experimented, ha haven't experimented with that at all. In every, everything that I've ever done, I was always only training one network that was responsible for everything at once. Yeah. Right. So, but but does learn from the top percent that keep the top five percent? Does that that mean you sort of like remember one of the best move lists, and then in the next generation you just do that that list of moves instead of um, you know like only ninety five percent of your moves are randomly sampled and that like top five percent is just the best from the last. Ah uh, no no that's that's a good question so that's not what it means at all. Uh, I keep the top five percent games that I've played. I'm going to put them in like a replay buffer, put them in a box, put it on the side. When I play games, I still only play according to neural network. I'm not looking at these best games that I have played. I'm using these best games only in the learning process. So every phase uh, consists of two parts. First, I play a thousand games, and then I learn from some the best constructions. In the playing, I'm only using no network. Everything is random. I'm not copying any moves from any best constructions. But in the learning phase, I learn from the top 10% of the current generation. And I'm also learning again from the top 5% globally that I've ever encountered. So that's uh -huh. the only thing I mean by keeping the top 5%. Cool, thanks. One thing I find so consoling about this cross entropy method is it looks a lot like supervised learning, which um, seems much easier to me. Like you're, you're just kind of observing the top 10% of the performance and then doing supervised learning on that and then repeating kind of. Yeah, so the cross entropy method is definitely one of the simplest things you can do, um, but maybe because of that. So the reason I picked it is because it was by far the most stable method out of all the things that I've tried. And really, really, when I picked the method to stick with, <clears throat> so when I decided that I'm going to use this method and just throw it at 100 conjectures, the only thing I had in mind at that point, I just really wanted to avoid pictures like that because it's just so, so, so time consuming to always have to figure out why your network is unstable and you will have to always optimize the hyperparameters for every new problem. And it's just not feasible if you just want to use the generalist approach. So, but it's also true that the cross entropy method is not the strongest, uh, best algorithm out there. So if you want to attack one specific problem, you probably shouldn't use this algorithm. You can use it as a baseline method, but you probably want to make some kind of value-based method like deep network algorithm work. I guess you could get a kind of value function you know, once you've done this, you could get a value function by just like Monte Carlo completing um, using your policy method. Um, and does that ever, you know, has that ever given you insight? Um, so you're saying train your neural network and once you have trained a neural network, you try to get a value function from it by just doing some rollouts, some Monte Carlo rollouts. Um, I, I suppose you could do that, and it might help you understand why the program is constructing what it's constructing. I haven't tried that, but 
would be an interesting way to understand what the network is actually doing for sure. But these things are just so difficult because you have such a big network and to understand what's actually happening is just always very challenging. Also, I was, I was very interested by your, your the Monte Carlo tree search point. We, could you elaborate on that? Honestly, in the Monte Carlo, we just tried a couple of different things, what could possibly work. So the most sensible thing to us was to use Monte Carlo in the phase where you're generating 1,000 constructions. So you could just generate it purely through the neural network, or instead you could try to build up some kind of Monte Carlo search tree. But you could, you could certainly do that, but the problem is what are you going to do after you've done these 1,000 constructions? Are you going to just throw away your Monte Carlo tree? Or are you going to keep it for the next iteration as well? Always throwing it out, it seems just like a very, very wasteful thing to do. And it's, uh, it will take you more time to build up this tree than what you're actually gaining from it. But you also cannot really keep it for the next iteration because you've already done a learning step. So the probability distribution has changed. So your Monte Carlo tree is not really valid anymore. So we really don't know what is a good way to combine cross entropy with Monte Carlo search here. Uh, what we did is, and what seemed to work pretty well, is to increase this number of thousand to a large number. So you're going to spend much more time exploring and trying much more, many more constructions because then you actually gain some advantage of doing this Monte Carlo search. But we are still just throwing out the tree after every iteration, which doesn't feel like a good thing to do, but we don't know any better thing to do. Thanks a lot. Let's thank Adam again for this beautiful talk. Thank you so much for coming.